Game of Thrones is back with a mild bang as House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 1, dropped like it's hot D on HBO Max. Or Max. Are we really going to call it Max, guys? <laughs> Anyways, House of the Dragon returns with more fire, more blood, and more betrayal as we kick off the new season, guys. So we're going to go through, break this down scene by scene, recap, review, give some insight, and see what we can discover from this episode. If you like these videos, like, comment, and subscribe. And let me know what you thought of the episode, guys. I'm going to give you guys my rating at the end. But for now, let's break this shit down, shall we? The episode begins with a brand new opening sequence, guys. No cold open, no scene before the intro. Just jumps right into the intro. And what we notice here, guys is that we have a brand new sequence. It's no longer that stone structure that had the bloodlines flowing through it from the previous season. It is now a, a thread, a, a tapestry of sorts, depicting the history of the Targaryen family, which is woven in fire and blood. We see the Targaryen symbol in glorious gold or reddish colors. We see the uh, King Jaehaerys. There's even like a dragon with uh, a lady head kind of hinting at the blood magic relating the Targaryens to the dragons. It was said that perhaps the Targaryens were created from the blood of dragons, and the dragons were actually kind of a mutant hybrid animal of sorts, which the ancient Valerians used blood magic to create. It's all convoluted, it's all complicated, and it's all ancient history by now, so nobody knows exactly how the dragons were created, but there are hints throughout the books and throughout the lore. At the final shot of the intro, we see a bunch of blank thread, a bunch of blank tapestry laid out for the what is going to become the rest of the history of the Targaryens family as they move through the Dance of Dragons, which is what this show is centered around, the War of the Blacks and the Greens. So that tapestry is going to be filled out as we move forward in the story. A pretty cool detail. The episode opens on a landscape shot and a POV of a raven as it heads for Winterfell. We're, we're hitting the ground running, guys, right away at Winterfell. They're not shying away from it. But there is sort of an issue I take here with this scene, and uh, I hope the rest of the season resolves it. I'll bring that up in a moment. We get a glorious shot of Winterfell here in its totality, and man, that's just breathtaking. The budget is clearly being put onto the screen in this season and in this show in general. They're just really good with their production values. You know, compared to something like Acolyte, uh, <laughs> we know how each show is using its budget. Or maybe we don't. Where is all that money going, Acolyte? Where is it going? In fact, if we look this up, under $20 million per episode with House of the Dragon, and it's about $23 million per episode with the Acolyte. So do the math there. Somebody's doing some laundry, if you know what I mean. Anyways, back to the episode. Now we come into the courtyard of Winterfell as we see Kragen Stark. He is the young leader, the young king of the north. Uh, he owes a great duty to the Seven Kingdoms, he says. Duty is sacrifice. It eclipses all things. The north owes a great duty to the Seven Kingdoms, one older than any oath. And of course, uh, if you've seen the original series or you've read the books, you know that he's talking about the Long Night. The Long Night, that is. Uh, he's supposed to be the protector of the realm in terms of guarding against the ancient evil of the Others, or the White Walkers, as they're called in Game of Thrones. You know, he is not worried about the war between kings. He's worried about the war at the Wall. And that's what they're doing here in this courtyard. There's a new tradition introduced in this show where the Starks every winter take one in 10 men from each household to send them off to do their duty protecting and guarding the North at the Wall. Back then, it was a huge honor to go to the Wall. You know, something that you look forward to in a, you know, deep kind of sad way, but still honorable nonetheless. That's how the Northerners see it. We also see Jace has landed at Winterfell. We don't get to see his dragon, and that is uh, kind of one of my issues. I wish they didn't rush into this Winterfell scene as hard as they did. Maybe if they stole three million uh, extra dollars from the Acolyte, they could have had a scene of Jace pulling up on his dragon. That would have been amazing, because one of the huge things that I would have loved to see is the reactions from the people, from Kragen, as Jace pulls up on his dragon. We don't get to see any of that. We're plopped right in the middle of Jace's meeting with Kragen. We finally get the line, the epic line, from Kragen Stark as they go up the elevator on the wall, and he says, The North must stand ready. Winter is coming. Winter is coming, guys. 
He's not worried. He doesn't give a shit too much about the the war of the blacks and the greens, but he uh, he he's more worried about the winter. Of course, as all Northerners do, they bury their head in the snow. I just love this elevator, man. I would be so scared to ride this thing. I mean, come on. It's medieval-esque technology, and you're going up a 700-foot ice wall. I mean, what could go wrong? What could go wrong? That thing snaps, push, you're dead. I don't know. I hate elevators. I take the stairs. You know, you can burn calories and save lives. What is this then that falls from the skies and shivers my bones? It's an elevator that falls from the sky and shivers my bones. No, it's the cold. Uh, <laughs> he's never seen snow. It's like a it's like a kid who lives in the Midwest who's never seen the ocean. You know, what is this water? Well, what are these uh, crystal-esque fragments that my feet so walk upon? He just has no clue what the winter is, and he's experiencing snow for the first time. It's amazing. Craigan kind of, you know, wh whips out his snowy dick and says, this is only a late summer snow, my prince. This is only a late summer snow, my prince. In winter, it'll cover all you see. <laughs> In winter, it'll cover all you see. Isn't it already covering everything? Anyways, you know, I did mention Kragen is the king of the north, but he's more of the warden of the north. You know, they bent the knee to the Targaryens a while back as uh, Jace and Kragen talk about this ancient contract between the houses. It pleases me to think that over a century ago, our ancestors treated in this very place. The realm will soon tear itself apart if men do not remember the oath sworn to King Viserys. Kragen says, Starks do not forget their oaths, my prince. Classic Ned Stark style attitude. Classic Northerner attitude. He talks about, he talks about the pact between uh, his ancestors, the, the ancient Starks and the, other, the older Targaryens. Surely the great Torrhen Stark would have sooner died than bent the knee. It was said that this pact was made because, you know, King Targaryen convinced them that it would be the only way to unite the Seven Kingdoms. But also, he might have told him about a greater danger that he saw in a vision, you know, a dream of sorts, where he, you know, saw visions of the White Walkers beyond the wall. And the Starks, being believers in the Long Night and having built this wall, you know, they said, hey, that's probably going to happen again. So we, uh, yeah, we want to fight against the great evil be on the wall with you. So not only is uniting the seven kingdoms a great idea, they were on board with uh, the Targaryens' dream of the White Walkers. And so that kind of helped unite the North with the Targaryens long ago. There's a couple of reasons, a couple of layers as to why this pact was formed. And now we're seeing it being re-strengthened, reinforced here with Cregan and Jace. And it's kind of, it's kind of nice. But you must know that my gaze is forever torn between North and South. Of course, though, the Starks always set their sights on the North over the South, over the main kingdom, because they believe that their duty is above all. And that's been reinforced here several times in this scene. And look at this beautiful shot of the North, guys. Jace has never seen anything like this in his entire life. One of the really crazy important details in this scene is when Cregan talks about Queen Alysanne and her dragon not being able to pass over the wall. My father brought King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne to see the wall and watched as their dragons, the greatest power in the world, refused to cross it. Maybe due to some ancient magic of sorts, and it really is telling that uh, the wall is more important than just a defense against the wildlings. You know, there is something in the magical lore of this world that is linked to the wall, a danger that even the dragons themselves are afraid of or are, you know, affected by. And that is, that's something not to take lightly. That connects, that really does connect the whole story of the White Walkers and the story of Game of Thrones together through this season. And I'm, I'm kind of glad that they're doing that. A lot of people are kind of mad that they're connecting it so hard, but uh, to me, it's fine. I like it. You know, let's move forward. Now, this is the funniest part of the conversation and the last part of the scene here as uh, Craig and says this to Jace. Do you think my ancestors built a 700 foot wall of ice to keep out snow and savages? <laughs> He's just like, what does it keep out? Death. Uh, can you elaborate? What? It looks pretty deathly out there. There's nothing but trees and wolves and wildlings, but death. I wish, you know, maybe in the future of this season, he'll go further into detail with Jace if they ever meet back up, but I'm not sure that they do because Jace ends up uh, getting a raven shortly and he has to leave. But not before he asks for help from Cregan. And this is very important, guys. I have thousands of gray beards who have already seen too many winters. They are well honed. So they're old. He pledges those to fight for the blacks. So he does secure some military aid from Cregan, but it's not exactly all he'd hoped for. Although these are the most trained and 
you know, well-honed warriors, they are on the older side. So <laughs> Kragan's willing to sacrifice his senior citizens for the cause. Great guy. Good guy, Kragan. So they're old. <laughs> so they're old. Yeah, they're old as shit, but they're going to fight like hell, okay? They're from the North, okay? And the North, remem the North remembers, unless they have dementia. Does the North remember even when they have dementia? I don't know. Maybe it's a superpower. If your greybeards can fight, the queen will have them. Yeah, if anybody could fight, the queen will have them. Even toddlers, you know? <laughs> okay, don't make toddlers fight. Okay, we already have enough toddler death in this episode. Spoilers, spoilers. Now here's where he gets the raven. A raven's arrived. Urgent news from Dragonstone. That look in Jace's eyes. Oh, you can just tell. It's, it's not going to be good when he returns home. Oh, it's going to be the toughest thing for him to, to do this episode. Is face that fact. Face the death of Lucerys. It's going to be a powerful scene. So we get Rhaenys and Maelys flying back into this dragon garage of sorts. It's like this cavern built into the back of Dragonstone where the dragons can land and enter a dragon pit. We have the dragon keepers here. It's just a really cool shot. Probably the coolest, one of the coolest dragon landing scenes that we've had. This is the, this is the budget on the screen. Take notes, Acolyte. This is the budget on the screen right here. This is crazy. I like the little detail as she uses a rope to like tether down the dragon because it's so big. I mean, they didn't have any of these kind of details in the original Game of Thrones when it came to when it came to <laughs> Danny riding her dragons. She just went she just went super raw, super bareback on those dragons. It was kind of kind of wild. We get Damon. He's like, "Take your mount again. We're flying out. We're flying out." And uh, Damon comes in and says, "No, we are. We're gonna do this instead. We're going to King's Landing. To what end? Killing Vega." He's like, let's go kill Vagar. You know, let's go kill Vagar. No, dude, you're not going to kill Vagar. Uh, she's been riding for like 24 hours straight, dog. Let her have a meal. Malus must gorge and rest. That's must die. I love how, <laughs> I love how Damon calls Vagar a hoary old bitch. I cannot face that hoary old bitch alone. <laughs> Interesting. Damon then says the most Chad line of the episode. With my dragon and yours together, we can kill Vagar in our rider. Make it a son for a son. Yeah, blood and cheese. Let's just say it gets bloody, it gets cheesy. The big argument between Rhaenys and Damon here is that, you know, Rhaenys being a female and being uh, not just a female, but obviously she relates to Rhaeny uh, Rhaenyra on that level, but she also understands emotions a little bit better than Damon, or at least how to react to them. And so she's talking about Rhaenyra needing the time to grieve, and Damon drops this bar. She has been gone for days, too long. She is exposed. She is grieving. The mother grieves as the queen shirks her duties. Now, what this means, obviously, is that Rhaenyra needs to put her personal emotions aside and become a lady boss queen of Westeros. And she's just not able to do that yet until she has closure, is what Rhaenys is saying in this scene. And to be honest, I'm on both sides. Yes, you know, give her time. But also, we don't have time, so... I'm kind of swinging towards Damon's fence here, side of the fence here. And so, yeah, it's it's kind of a tough thing. Rhaenys wants Rhaenyra to be emotionally competent in order to start ruling again and take her place. Damon's just like, nah, fuck that shit. Let's go. Let's get our dragons. Let's go kill Vagar. Let's go kill Aemon. Let's go. He's out for blood. He also has a weird kind of um, theme this episode as he tells Rhaenys this. If you'd have acted when you had the chance, Aegon's line would be extinguished. So he's going to go around blaming everybody for not killing Aegon when they had the chance. And I think that's just him not being able to kind of reconcile with the fact that he doesn't have the power to do what he wants at the moment. And other people did, and they failed in his eyes. But, you know, as she mentioned in the prior season, it was not her war to start. And I feel like Damon's being unfair to these characters as he tries to pin the blame of the war dragging on. Because they didn't kill Aegon. I mean, come on, man. You can't really expect them to kill Aegon. There's a lot of political machinations that would result from that action that these other characters don't feel they have the responsibility to take. So <sighs> Damon's kind of uh, lashing out, if you will. Now, here's where Rhaenys drops the uh, most Chad line of her scene here. Fly with me. It is a command. What that you were the king. Would that you were the king. Yeah, she says, no, get lost. Kick rocks, brother. We, uh, we're not listening to you because we got a queen. And uh, I'll wait for her word. Speaking of queens, we get a shot of Rhaenyra herself dressed in her fabulous red 
attire. I love this little, uh, I love this little fit. She's just got the drip. She's got the hair. She's got the drip. Drip aside, it is wet. She's on the ocean side here. Uh, Shipwreck Bay, I think what it's called, something like that. But it's basically right outside the Baratheon's keep, Storm's End. And she is kind of investigating, perhaps looking for the remains of her son to confirm the truth of the death. Now, I really wish there was a scene of her confronting the Baratheons or something, but that's a little too bold. She might get into dangerous waters, so to speak, if she did that. So she's, she keeps herself at a distance, but she's got her eye on them. She's got her eye on them. We don't really get much else in this little scene. It's not even really a scene. It's just a couple of shots. She's got a really dirty face. She looks like she's been doing chimney sweeps. Yeah, that's all we get from her. Then we cut to a shipyard here, and we have our main man, Corliss. Corliss is clearly still not the full, you know, warrior that he used to be from his accident in the uh, War of the Stepstones. I mean, I kind of like the look. It's kind of got some swagger to it. But yeah, he's not the same man he was. He's on his, he's on his way out in this world. Which is something that's kind of tough for him because, you know, he just set up his line of succession with Luke and now that line has been extinguished. So he's in sort of a dire situation here when it comes to the political machinations of his house and his family and the positionings of them as well. Now he comes to the shipyard to talk to a man named Alan, the man who pulled him out of the water, as Corliss says, during his fatal or near fatal accident from last season. The gullet is vast and we're not like to have the numbers to cover all that open water. I must have my ship back at sea. So Corliss is talking about getting these ships back to sea to lead the effort in the blockade against King's Landing so that they can, you know, stop the resources from flowing in and kind of choke out the uh, Greens and uh, win the war through a more peaceful means, if you will, which is probably not going to go down that way. But they're trying. They're trying to do a blockade. Alan then pulls something very important, very vital to Corliss uh, out of his uh, little bag here as he presents the sword made for young Prince Lucerus. Now, you can see a very interesting detail here as they talk about the rescue of Corliss. They tell me that you're the one that dragged my body out of the sea. And Alan is kind of, um, he's kind of grating his fingers in the same way that uh, Alicent does in the earlier season. This tells me that, you know, he does have his loyalties to Corliss, but perhaps there's something boiling underneath the surface, some sort of conflict that he's fighting with. I don't know. It just is very awkward the way they interact here and the way that he's kind of fidgeting with his hands as if he's anxious about something. Something seems off beneath the surface with this Alan character. So we're going to have to keep watch on him throughout the season. I am indebted to you, Alan. Corliss saying that he's indebted to him, and Alan looks down at the floor out of almost guilt or shame or something. It's just, again, more signs that uh, perhaps, you know, there's there's more to Alan than meets the eye. This character could end up changing the tides, so to speak. Pun intended, as we move forward. Now we're back at King's Landing with the Greens here as we enter one of the main courtyards. We see Brother Eric. We're going to call him Green Eric because it's super hard for me to say Eric and Eric and have you guys understand who is who. So we're going to call this Green Eric. All right, this is uh, Allison's Eric. You know, the brothers that split last season. This is one half of the twins here. And he's uh, manning the wall, waiting for potential threats from Dragonstone or from the Blacks. Uh, he's looking out for dragons as they have this big ballista crossbow thing. I think it's called the... Um, Dragon! I'm the Scorpion! The Scorpion. Yes, arm the Scorpion, they say. Now, it's funny because Kyburn in the Game of Thrones show, the original series, uh, he pretended that he invented this thing. And they've had this they've had this blueprint since the days of old. So sneaky little Kyburn using his using his words to uh, convince everybody he's a genius. But I mean, he kind of is. But also he didn't invent this thing, man. This thing's existed. It's like somebody finding an iPhone and saying they're Steve Jobs. <laughs> Anyways, they prepare to shoot. Scorpion ah! ready! Hold! And nope. Stun down, it's Vagar! Stun down! It's Vagar. Now, Vagar's got like a cheese grater, you know, pair of wings here. I don't know. I don't know how uh, how that affects the flight physics of Vagar, but Vagar, she seems to be doing pretty good despite the holes in her wings. So, whatever. Interesting detail. I always liked that detail. She's sort of old and weathered, but she still gets the job done, you know, like a, like a Ford. This is what it feels like to drive a Ford, to drive a Vagar. You know what I'm saying? Built, built Ford tough. <laughs> built Vagar tough. I would feel pretty good having Vagar protect my skies. So they've got a they've got a huge advantage there with the biggest dragon, the nuclear bomb of dragons, on their side. Now we cut to one of the funniest scenes in the episode here, as we have 
Helena and her handmaidens, and we also have King Aegon interacting in this room. She's weaving threads. I don't know what she's making. She's making something, but she's always making something. Now, King Aegon and Helena have twins, uh, Jehera and Jaharis, I believe. And this is the girl twin right here. Where is Jaharis? Attending his lessons. <laughs> it's funny because Aegon doesn't even know where his kid goes every day for lessons. He has no clue. He thinks that Jahera was Jaharis. He's just sort of clueless, but my, my most favorite part about this episode is Aegon. He's sort of a new guy. He's a new man. Ever since that moment when he raised his sword at the crowd in, I believe, episode nine, he really has taken on this kingly attitude, but in a way that's like overconfident and sort of playful. He's not as serious as uh, maybe he thinks he is, or maybe he should be, in, especially in this time of war and this time of uh, political strife. Now, at least he does take his duties seriously with his heir, uh, which is kind of a contrast to his father, Viserys, who didn't really pass down his kingship too well to anybody in his family. He didn't, he didn't go as hard as he should with training Rhaenyra up to be, you know, his heir. And he certainly didn't pay attention to Aegon almost at all. So at least Aegon's being a better father, seemingly for now, in terms of... Um, his royal duty to craft an heir, to build up his heir and continue his lineage on the throne, which is interesting. You know, you're seeing some dynamics and some growth from Aegon, or at least attempted growth from him. He's a whole, he's almost a whole different character than he was. He's cleaned up a bit. He seems like he's happy in his position, whereas before he was running from it. He's now embracing it for now. <laughs> oh, I love this little uh, facial expression from uh, Aegon here as he addresses Helena. He'll be king one day. He must begin his instruction. What if he does not want to be king? Where is he? He's sort of super condescending in a playful way. And I, I don't know, I get some sort of, I get a mix of Damon and Viserys all in one character from Aegon this season so far. He's like a mixture of the best of both, or maybe the worst of both. Who knows? Helena says that uh, Jay Harris is in the library studying and uh, he must not interrupt, but he doesn't care. He's going to interrupt. Now, I said this is the funniest scene in the uh, episode, perhaps, and uh, this is why. <laughs> Watch this. I'm afraid. Don't be. They'd be fools to come with Vega protecting the city. Not the dragons. The rats. She says the rats, and now we all know she's kind of cryptic with her words. She doesn't always mean literally what she says. What are the rats, guys? Nobody, nobody in the room knows what the hell she's talking about, and it's kind of an allegory for the audience, as we always are wondering what the hell Helena is saying. But um, there actually is two versions of what the rats are in this episode. There are literally rats, as we saw in last season, and especially in this season, it's a big deal. There are literally actual rats infesting the keep, but... Perhaps there are other rats, beasts beneath the boards that she's afraid of, you know, in an allegorical sense. We then cut to a scene with Allison getting down with Kristen Cole, or more like Kristen Cole going down on Allison. And uh, good for them, good for them. But uh, honestly, Allison, you're just a big hypocrite at this point. You cannot claim the moral high ground anymore. You're making Christian break his vows. You are sleeping around as the queen out of wedlock. This is just exactly everything that you said you hated from Rhaenyra. So you've become the ultimate hypocrite. Although, you know, I don't blame you. I don't blame, I don't blame Christian either. Okay. It just, it had to happen at some point. Who knows how long they've been doing this and who knows how badly this is going to go for both of them if this gets exposed. Allison talks about a chill in the air and how summer is at its end. And she also puts the white cloak back on to Kristen here, which is kind of symbolic of her kind of trying to cloak her immorality with her uh, perceived per uh, persona that she has in her head of herself as this morally moral high ground person of sorts, so to speak. She also says this to Kristen. We cannot. Again. And they agree not to continue the physical sexual relationship, but that's not going to last, is it? <laughs> Pun intended, that's not going to last. There's a joke in there somewhere. All right, moving forward. Now, here is the first shot we get of our man Cheese, one of the rat catchers, as he's with his dog, his little sidekick. 
It's important to note that he's able to just slip around in the background like this for later. Anyways, we come to a high council meeting and we get our first shot of uh, Otto Hightower. Now, this is the second funniest scene in the episode as I believe it's uh, Tylen Lannister, master of coin, kind of just gets toyed with by young heir to the throne, Jay Harris here. Stormlands should be ours after Prince Aemon's marriage pact to the Lady Floris Baratheon. I think this is kind of symbolic of how the, you know, the higher ups, the kings, the royal family is just playing with their subjects. They're using them as pawns at their will. This is going to cause some perhaps conflict and disgruntlement amongst the lower lords beneath the royal families. I think it's, it is a playful scene, but it also does mean a little bit more beyond the surface. Our letters to the Vale and to the North continue to go unanswered. Cunts. <laughs> what a guy. We love that, huh? This is this is what I'm talking about. This is a really funny portrayal from uh from Tom Lynn Carney, I believe. Probably butchered that name, who knows. But uh yeah, it's, he's a whole new character. He, but he still has that essence of Aegon within him. He's just he's kind of transformative in his uh performance here. I always look at I always look at a uh, Tylen Lannister here and I just see Dave Portnoy. I don't know, that's just a weird thing in my head. Does anybody in the comments feel that? Just let me know. You can't unsee it. I like how we have a couple of council members that are at least concerned with the politics of how this all went down with the death of Lucerys. My letters to Rhaenyra, has there been any answer? An apology for her dead son? This dude on the left here seems like he's kind of concerned, like, hey, we should make up for what we did. We should try to make peace. We should try to say sorry, at least. Nobody else on the council really seems to care about that aspect of it. So at least we have some balance here from the council. I like that. In hopes that new terms might not might be negotiated. Release it at once. So Jaharis keeps playing and messing around with uh, Tylen's little council ball. And uh, Aegon says this. Is the heir to the throne bothering you, Tyland? And Tylen's just like, no, no, not at all, sir. No, 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 no not in the least, Your Grace. <laughs> Aegon's going to make Dave Portnoy give a pony ride, a piggyback ride to young Jaharis here. Because I think he wants a ride. Your Grace. A, a ride. A pony ride. It's almost like a, a light version of that scene. I get Homelander vibes from, uh, I think, episode one of the new season of The Boys, where Homelander tells <laughs> tells the Deep, go blow a train. It's just that you make a lot of really great points, sir. Deep. Blow a train. And then he ends up not doing it, just like this scene as well. Now, it's it's a totally different set of actions, but it's kind of the same vibe. <laughs> Allison, obviously, being the voice of reason, he speaks up and he's, she's like, hey, stop fucking around, Aegon. We're not doing piggyback rides with the Master of Coin. Your Grace, there are important matters to discuss. We got a war to fight. She also kind of puts the blame on Tylen. Despite Sir Tylen's interruptions. And they're all just kind of using him as a punching bag in this meeting because, you know, you don't want to blame Aegon for causing the disruption. You don't want to blame Jaehaerys for it. They're royal family members. You just kind of put the blame on the master of coin. He's kind of getting the shit under the stick here. Sorry, Dave Portnoy. Very well. No time for amusements, Tyland. <laughs> no time for amusements. Yeah, Tyland, get fucked. Sorry, Dave Portnoy. He'll give us a pizza review. So he literally brings Jaehaerys into the council meeting to fuck with Tylen and then leave. There's like no point in it. He's just kind of messing around with his new uh, position of power. So he's kind of on the same mindset here as Damon, as he says, we should have killed, you know, we should have killed him when they had the chance. Rhaenyra's blockade has placed King's Landing under strain and those pressures will multiply quickly. Well, we should have just killed her when we had the chance. Him and Damon are both men of action. They, they have this you know, immediacy and their need to be pragmatic when uh, ending things quickly and taking the easy route. But uh, none of them had the uh, correct foresight to do so. And now we're breaking out into full-scale war. If we are to break the Sea Snakes blockade, we will need to bolster both the Lannister and Hightower navies. Now, they mention a new master of ships, potentially uh, Dalton Greyjoy, as the Greyjoys are known for being, uh, you know, really good on the seas. You know, they're, that's part of their lore. That's part of their uh, traditions being known for being able to take to the seas and go do some real damage. So maybe we'll get some Greyjoys in this season later on. But then we get young Aemond entering the scene here. Aemond, what is your business here? The king summoned me. You do not have a seat at this council. I love Aemon's walk. He has this sort of video game villain walk. It is kind of mechanical and robotic, but it still, it fits his character. He's sort of an anime villain, a video game villain. It's just hilarious. Path to King's Landing is through the Riverlands. We must establish a toehold there. 
Now, the Riverlands are a very important uh, location, a vital location to secure power in Westeros, and they want a toehold. Everybody wants a toehold there, and it's clear that Amon is not only a good fighter, he also has a mind for tactics. So he's going to be a very, impor a very important player in this season in the War of the Dance of the Dragons. The River Lords will either declare for me, or they will meet Vhagar and Sunfire together, and, and we can burn the blockade while we're at it. <laughs> okay, yeah, Aegon says the funniest thing here where he's talking about uh, his dragon power versus the dragon power of the blacks, and he says, Rhaenyra has dragons as well. Mine are bigger. Mine are bigger. Yeah, just, he's just whipping out his dragons left and right, and he thinks that dragons and, you know, show of force can solve everything, but Alicent and Otto are kind of erring on the side of caution here instead. We must proceed cautiously. Now, fat old Lord Tully will either raise my banner or see his burn. We should fly to River Run. That is exactly something that Damon would say. You know, fat Tully will raise his banner for me or see it burn. You know, that's exactly what Damon would say. This is, Amon and Aegon are kind of like, the re-embodiment of, of Damon with a little mix of, Aegon has a little mix of the lightheartedness of Viserys, but with a sinister spin on it. It's interesting. Otto Hightower says something very, um, in a very politically correct manner. He says this. Errors were made in the hours following King Viserys' death. Notice how he doesn't call anybody out for anything. He just says mistakes were made. He's he's very neutral in his statements, uh, being very careful not to offend anybody so he can stay in his position. You know, he, he speaks with care. We always like that from him. We must now favor patience and restraint. I send ravens by the hour. <laughs> Aegon just wants to go fire in blood mode, and Otto is just like, no, dude, chill, chill out. Aegon spins his council ball in boredom, and we cut to a scene with our main man here, Laris. Good morning, Your Grace. Good morning, Lord Laris. Now, Laris notices that she was indisposed. But your handmaiden said that you were indisposed. He's kind of subtly hinting that he knows what's going on with Kristen and her, and now he has some leverage over her head, and Alicent realizes her mistake as she makes this little head turn here. And he asked for a word in private, but not before he talks about his uh, latest mission, which was to weed out the unloyal staff at the keep. And he says this very eerie line to Allison when she asks what he's done with them. I have completely questioning the whole of the castle staff. They no longer breathe our air. What a freaking Giga Chad. Giga Chad energy. But like, not really. He's like a beta Chad. He's like a beta Chad. Is that a new? I just meant that a new word, a beta Chad. We then cut to a scene with Allison bathing, and she's scrubbing off the guilt and the shame from uh, her actions, and perhaps her uh, her guilt towards Lucerius's death as well. Kind of a cute little scene here. Just leave, just, leave, just leave me. She can't be seen. She doesn't want to be seen by her handmaidens. Even she wants to be alone in her in her guilt as she furiously scrubs it off, physically and mentally. We then cut to a scene where Rhaenyra and Cyrax have landed at the, the wreck site where she's going to discover something very vital to her character progression in this season here. One of the locals here says it's a dragon wing. It's a dragon wing! It's a wing! And then they see this. Dragon! Yeah, I would run away if there's a dragon coming too. No matter if it's a friendly one or an enemy one, I'm running the fuck away, man. And we get this slick dismount. Look at that dismount. Can we, re can we watch that again? <laughs> Probably the best dismount we've ever seen in Game of Thrones dragons scenes. Now the music rises, the solemn music rises as Rhaenyra discovers the dragon wing. Now, th this is the only thing I ever had a problem with in the production. The dragon wing kind of just looks like cloth. Now I know it, it's covered in a like fisher net thing, but uh, the dragon wing didn't sell me as much as it should have. I, I feel like it should have been more like scaly a little bit. It, it looks like a cloth, but that's fine. That's fine. That's the least of our worries here. And we see the armor and the remains of the dragon wing and, uh, and young Luke. We see his, uh, his robes, his cape or whatever that is. Obviously, it's his, his red attire. She's finally able to fully confront her loss and confirm the suspicions. Luke is dead. Luke is, is passed. Now, it's interesting we get a shot of the locals overlooking her as she's grieving. This kind of might humanize her in the eyes of the locals. Yeah, she's a dragon rider. She is a, a royal uh, queen of sorts, and, you know, she's this all-powerful being. But at the end of the day, she's still human just like the rest of them. Kind of nice. Cyrax roars as he feels the pain through, uh, through the rider, Rhaenyra. 
And that's sort of hinting at the mental link between Dragon and Ryder, which is a cool little detail. Now we get the cockiest scene yet from Aegon here as he walks in with his boys. Hey, King Aegon. Aegon the Magnanimous. Aegon the Magnanimous. Like, who are these guys? <laughs> yeah, Aegon kind of looks at him and he's like, what the hell is the Magnanimous? The Magnanimous. <laughs> you fucking buffoon. <laughs> And now here is where we get a nice interaction between Otto, Aegon, and the townsfolk, the, the small folk of King's Landing. Good morrow, uh, your grace. It's all right. <laughs> there's no reason to be nervous. Uh, there's no reason to be nervous. Um, excuse me. You have a dragon cider, and you are the king. I am going to be nervous as hell, okay? Because that's just, that's just how it's going to go. So Aegon tells one of the local farmers that he can have his flock back. They took a tax from him to feed the dragons. They took some of his sheep. How might your king be of service? Tis my flock. Aegon tells the man that he can return it, and he wants to be a man of the people. Aegon wants the people to love him. So he's like, yeah, we'll return your shit. We'll give back your taxes. If I'd had the time to plan, We should perhaps. return them. Our dragons don't need to eat. And then Otto steps up and says this. We already made a promise to all the crown lands that a tithing of livestock would be necessary to sustain the dragons for their increased activity and pray not eventual fighting. Now, Otto is trying to convince Aegon that we can't do this because, you know, if you give one sheep back, you're going to have to give everybody their sheep back. And we also see Laris in the background lurking. He's always lurking, man. He knows everything. And Aegon doesn't seem to understand that his, his words actually do have power. He doesn't understand the effect of his own actions yet. He's just playing around. He's playing as king right now. He's not truly a king yet. Perhaps we could just return his sheep. He came all this way. If you return one herd of sheep, your grace, you'll soon find them all at the foot of your throne expecting the same. He doesn't understand his duties, and he doesn't understand the levity of every little thing that he does. Then Otto drops this bar right here. Otto's always dropping bars, and he says this. When the king speaks, your grace, all hear it. Yeah, you dumbass, Aegon. Anything you do is going to be known by everybody. That's just how this world works. After further thought, I have decided that I cannot restore your sheep. <laughs> He's like, yo, uh, just kidding. We're not giving the sheep back. Sorry, motherfuckers. Like, it, it is what it is. We're at war. Again, Aegon is just hasty with uh, his, you know thirst for blood and for war and for fire and he says this to one of the other guys he requests aid due to the blockade and aegon says this with a blockade in place and war threatening that treasonous blockade won't last long i plan to send vagar to burn it to ash the look on otto's face here is just like uh are you sure we're i don't think we're doing that quite yet uh sire <laughs> we then get this man named hugh he's part of the smiths and he's probably going to be an important guy in this season as he says this iron costs have grown to put it simply we are struggling if we could have the crown's coin before we started work now Aegon's already bent to the request of Otto once but he's not going to have it he's going to put his foot down here as he says this my army cannot win a war without your weapons you should continue their making now this is the funniest part in this scene right here as Otto is like god damn it I have to go up the stairs again and tell this fool Aegon that he's fucking up but Aegon's just like making a very good point here as he talks about needing the small folk our victory depends on the efforts of the small folk <laughs> and Otto's like, fuck, he's right. Ah, he's right. Shit, I can't push my limits. You know, if he, if he clashes with Aegon too much, he's going to reach that threshold where Aegon's going to be like, you know, get the hell out of here. I don't need you anymore. So he has to play his cards very carefully, obviously. So Aegon's kind of learning how to wield his power and uh, navigate his underlings like Otto without being undermined, you know, that's going to be a huge, that's going to be a huge conflict this season is how much power can Aegon wield without getting too much pushback from his, you know, his servants or his uh, royal commanders. We then cut to a scene with Laris and again, Aegon, as he kind of uh, butters him up, he kind of kisses his ass a little bit and he compares him to King Jaehaerys. I was only a boy when Jaehaerys last graced the seat, but you brought forth memories of him and he was such a deft touch with the small folk, just as your father did. I mean, it's like Aegon's first real day doing kingly shit, and Larys is already like, dude, you're the best king ever. You're like King Jaehaerys, the great king. And it's just funny. He's trying to get on his good side. Larys is always working an angle. He then asks for a quiet word with uh, Aegon. And uh, how quiet can it really be? They're like five feet away, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> they are clearly all watching. Larys talks about uh, how Otto is kind of a conniving little bastard and how he used to control uh, Viserys in the same way he's trying to do to Aegon. So here is Larys kind of undermining Otto, maybe setting himself up for a Hand of the King position. 
Who knows? This the hands want to keep a firm grip on things. He controlled your father the same way. I feel like Larry's and Aegon are going to get along very well together as they both have similar attitudes. And Larry's just knows how to sweet talk a guy, you know? Larry's talks about the importance of Aegon needing to stake his claim as king and portray the right powerful image in order to get what he wants out of the throne, out of the, out of the position and the power of the throne. You know, he can't immediately take the throne and be seen as a baby who can be controlled by Otto. I would think, as we find ourselves standing within a hair's breadth the wall, that you would wish to be viewed differently. Now, how is Larry's going to use this to his gain? Well, hopefully just by getting on Aegon's good side and, um, you know, being rewarded for such. We then cut to a scene with uh, father and daughter here, Otto and Alicent, as he walks into the room on her. And Otto's always drinking wine in this episode. I think three, two or three times he hits, the, he hits the bottle here. I would too, if I was Otto. You know, it's a little stressful job. I find myself wondering, do we pursue the same end? They talk about being on the same team. Are they pursuing the same goals? And Otto kind of, in a roundabout way, says that they are, even though they're going about it in different ways. He's kind of been undermining her at the council meetings uh, in front of the king, in front of her sons. And she's got a big problem with this because if he keeps doing it, she's never going to be taken seriously. And as a woman, you know, it's already hard enough for her to be taken seriously. But um, she is the, you know, the queen mother. And she needs to be having her power and her word respected. And Otto's not helping her do that. It's not in Otto's best interest because he wants to be able to have final say on things. And so he kind of brushes it off. And I would not repeatedly cut my legs from beneath me at that table of men. I sit there and I feel your anger. Frustration. Allison talks about the incident with uh, killing Luke. And uh, <laughs> Otto just kind of brushes it off. He's like the caprice of youth. But it was son took his eye was never punished for it what he did how the vicious the priests of youth you know that's what kids your kids being kids you know they kill each other with dragons that's just what happens and honestly it was kind of disappointing for me in this episode that we didn't get to see a full aftermath confrontation scene with Amund and the high towers and and you know I wanted to see the look on Allison's face, the look on Otto's face and the smirk on uh likely on Aegon's face as they you know, discussed the death, but it's just, it's a missed opportunity for me that they didn't have that scene between the royal family, the high council even. Maybe they would have had a scene where Amon had to go address the whole entire high council. So I'm, I guess we, we get an understanding of how people view that event through little snippets, but we don't actually get the scene where that, that comes to a head. We just, we never really get that. It's kind of disappointing. Amon heard, but he is fiercely loyal. He wishes to please. Now, Otto says that Amon is still extremely loyal to Alicent, but we learn later in the episode that he kind of just thinks that his mom's a fool, which is interesting to say the least. Alicent says something very important to Otto about the machinations and the, the power grab that they have with Aegon. We only need to mind Aegon until the novelty of road is spent. Once he tires of it, you and I can steer our cause to victory. You know, she's just hoping that Aegon will get bored of being playing as king and that they can go back to controlling him as uh they don't think Aegon is quite fit to rule they think he's going to be too rash he's going to make the wrong decisions he's going to escalate things too quickly and uh not mind his resources properly i shall make your flock of sheep ho then otto drops yet another bar a fine strategy daughter but you must accept that the path to victory now is one of violence he says prepare for war bitch this is happening get behind it or get lost we then get the glorious theme of the Valarians as we cut to another scene here. We see the ships in the blockade. We get the uh, we get the the Eric on the side of the uh, the blacks of Rhaenyra, you know, the one that defected, and he's now raiding ships from King's Landing with the uh, the fleet from Corlys during the blockade, and he's going to discover something interesting in this ship. Yeah. And who do we find? But we find the white worm herself, Missaria. When last we met, there were two of you. Now, she still has that kind of strange accent, but it's toned down a lot this season, I feel. Then we cut to a scene where Damon is confronting his ex-lover. I did not think you would flower a traitor. You speak of highborn games. I'm commonborn. How long have you been selling secrets to Otto Hightower? Now, this scene, in a nutshell, is basically Damon saying, you had the king, you had the, the, the ultimate chess piece in your grasp, and you let it go. Again, this is Damon lashing out at everybody else for not getting the job done, where he thinks if he was in that position, he would have just, you know, went full fire in blood mode 
and assassinated the king. This is that ended with the theft of the queen's throne and the murder of her son. You only blame me because your true enemies are out of reach. And he's, so, he's sort of just, you know, putting the blame everywhere he can this episode. He's kind of being a little whiny, but, you know, that's just kind of part of Damon's character. He asks, uh, he asks the white worm here. How long have you been sending secrets to Otto Hightower? As long as he had gold to pay for that. And he's pissed. He's pissed. You put Egon on the throne. That was the Hightower's conspiracy. I merely profited from knowing Egon's movement. Damon tries to get more information from her, but she says that she's got nothing for him, really. And we kind of move on from this. We then get another scene of Damon lashing out at uh, Brother Eric here. And it's just, it is getting a little tired. He's just going around blaming everybody for not snatching up the king and killing him. Egon was in your grasp. You should have killed him yourself. However, it is very interesting as Eric says this to Damon. And we swore the same oath to defend the whole of the royal family. So what were we to do when they turn against one another? He kind of has a rock solid argument here. I mean, he's sworn to protect the royal family. And what happens if there is now two royal families? Damon maybe starts to realize, okay, well, you know what? You guys didn't take, you know, things into your own hands. So I'm going to do it now. This is where uh, we cut to a scene where Rhaenyra returns home to meet Damon and finally confront her grief together. It's nice that Damon's kind of being a sweet husband, finally, instead of choking her out, you know? <laughs> Good guy, Damon. He wants her to be back on her queen shit, you know? I will fly to Harry Bord at your command and set our toehold in the Riverlands. Again, they're talking about the Riverlands here, a very important, vital position that both families are going to be vying for. I'm assuming there's going to be a battle at the Riverlands midway through this season. They talk about the blockade moving into place with Corliss's ships. Your Grace, my Lord Husband's blockade of the Gullet moves into place. All sea one travel and trade to King's Landing will soon be cut off. And Rhaenyra drops this bomb on the council here. I want Aemon Targaryen. And Damon's like, I got you, bitch. Let's go. Let's do this. I've been waiting to kill somebody this whole episode. We then cut to a very vital scene between, again, Masaria and Damon as he's seeking information regarding perhaps some traitorous men amongst the Greens in King's Landing. In your years as a merchant of gossip, you surely accumulated spies within the Red Keep, servants who knew the comings and goings. And Damon offers her a transaction. He's going to give her the freedom and she's going to give him the spies. We then cut to probably the saddest scene in the episode as young Prince Jace here returns from his trip to secure the political alliances in the North and in the Vale. And uh, he says this as he breaks down to Rhaenyra. And Lord Quicken Stark has promised 2,000 men. It's just a, a heartfelt moment, a true moment of humanity between these two. And it really endears us to the plight of the Blacks. And it shows us that the family bond is a little tighter and more authentic and more based on love than it is with the Greens, who are a lot more about being schemers and a lot more about their machinations and their use of power. What's interesting here is now we cut to a scene of Alicent, and she's at a sept here, and she's going to light some candles in honor of some of her fallen family members, including Lucerys. So she still has a connection, a bond, a, a guilt for her actions when it comes to the betrayal of Rhaenyra. And the, the way they connect these shots with the funeral pyre and the candles at the sept kind of hints that there is still an emotional bond between Rhaenyra and Alicent. There's still a connection there. It's, it's, it's hanging on by a thread. Now, we get Damon with his classic murder cloak. You know, when Damon's in a cloak, you better watch the fuck out. Something's going to happen. Now, he arrives at the backwaters of King's Landing and comes to this gate where he kind of way too conveniently finds his spy here uh, in the form of blood. One half of blood and cheese. A tribute. Commander. As you see, he goes right to calling him commander. He's clearly still loyal to Damon. So he picked, a, he picked a good spy. Good on you, White Worm. She made a good call here. I guess she can be trusted. Now Damon asks him, uh, are you still loyal? I told you Barry misliked for the High Towers. Fuck the High Towers. <laughs> Fuck the High Towers. Yeah, this guy's out for blood. But he lets Damon in to the castle and they meet with the rat catcher, a.k.a. Cheese. I was also given to understand that you possess a unique knowledge of the Red Key. Michael's tunnels. Type of rat's nest it is. It's a very convenient thing that there's a lot of rats uh, needing to be exterminated because, again, he can use this as a disguise to get his way into the castle. Perfect, perfect, uh, perfect way to get an assassination done. Now, Damon asks him uh, if he's a betting man. I heard the white one was dead. That ghost told me you're a betting man. 
and he uses the fact that he might be uh he might be in need of some coin and all this guy cares about is money he doesn't care about loyalty so he's gonna get the job done if the cash is there but this guy being a rat catcher he knows every angle he knows every tunnel in the castle he's been he's been through it all so he's the perfect guy to get in there and get the job done and the rat catcher here drops the funniest bar of the episode as he says this i was also given to understand that you possess a unique knowledge of the red key i know them better than the shape of my own cock <laughs> yeah well what a way to put it damon then introduces blood to cheese and now we have the ultimate dynamic duo as he tells them their mission you to find and slay the prince Aemon targaryen <laughs> look at the face on this dude as he's like wait i have to assassinate a prince all right give me the money <laughs> he kind of he kind of has regret on his face but he's also he needs the money so he's gonna do it they also ask what happens if we can't find Damon, and uh damon kind of just stares at them and we cut to the next scene we've wasted precious days in this war of quills and ravens words are wind and now in this next scene we get Amon and we get Kristen Cole strategizing behind the back of Otto Eye Tower and behind the back of the king, which is something that's not sort of respected by Otto. You should be leading the van. And I should be flying cover on Vega. No castle would dare to raise Rhaenyra's banner against us. <laughs> Screw Blood and Cheese. We're the best duo in Westeros. We're gonna go head on with the Vanguard and my dragon, and we're just gonna wreak havoc across Westeros until everybody bends the knee. Rosby and Stokeworth, small castles right in the shadow of King's Landing. They would not want us for enemies. They could add their levies to our own. They talk about wanting to sort of keep gathering more troops as they advance through Westeros. Amon then talks about a very important detail that he's noticed, that Aegon doesn't quite have the power he thinks he has. My brother is hostage to my grandsire and mother, and they tell him that the War of Dragons can yet be avoided. And here's where we learn that Kristen and Aemon are actually truly on the same page, as they know a war of dragons is inevitable. Aegon then talks about the hypocrisy of Alicent, his mother. She blames me for starting this war, after she plotted with my father's counsel to usurp his throne. He's like, bitch, you started the war before I started the war, okay? We both started the war, but you started the war. And he has this smug look on his face all the time. I mean, the dude's an anime villain, right? Holy shit. Her grace speaks with two tongues. Her grace speaks with two tongues, he says, and Kristen's like, I know a thing or two about tongues. <laughs> Anyways, moving forward. <laughs> and Rhaenyra is a cunning spider. Long ago, she drew Alison into her web. He calls Rhaenyra a cunning spider and says this. Intoxicated her. It is not your mother's fault. Listen, Kristen, I think you were the one who was intoxicated by Rhaenyra, but uh, clearly he just sees her as an evil cunt. And now here's where Amon truly reveals his feelings towards Alicent as he says this. She holds love for her enemy. That makes her a fool. And enter Otto Hightower. He's not too pleased that there's scheming going on without him in the room, because he's the ultimate schemer, right? Return to your post, Lord Commander. I must have a word with the prince. We still see the power dynamic between Kristen Cole and Otto. Now, Kristen Cole does have a lot more power now than ever being the head of the Kingsguard um, and being close with Amon and Alicent, but he still has to kind of bend the knee or <laughs> straighten his knees for uh, Otto Hightower as he gets on his knees for Alicent. And here's where Otto reveals that he's not too pleased with what's going on here. It would concern me, grandson, if plans were being considered beyond the ears of your king and his hand. But Amon fires back as he says this. I only wish to serve my king and my house. Now, Otto obviously recognizes he has to play his cards correctly here because, you know, he's got a nuclear bomb on his hands. You and Vega, the greatest single power in the realm. But there are many pieces at play here. Now, he talks about there's many pieces at play, some of which that you can't see. Now, this is quite ironic because there's a couple of pieces at play right now that both of these guys can't see coming. Now here's where we get blood and cheese beginning their journey through the castle. Let's do this. They enter through this sewer of sorts, sort of a back entrance into the upper levels of the keep. He says, bring the dog. It's important because he needs to play the part, obviously. You know, as he's been seen in other scenes earlier, lurking around the castle, it's just sort of a normal thing for him to be able to wander around as, you know, one of the head, basically like one of the head janitors. That's why, that's why he's able to so easily sneak through here. And they sneak through, and they come upon Aegon and his boys, just having a good old Aegon and the boys session, as they do. Aegon the strong. My nephew's already taken that one. It's a king. Aegon talks about being a symbol of the small folk here, and he's kind of shooting the shit with the boys, and he says a very funny line here. No, no one knows what magnanimous means. <laughs> No one knows what magnanimous means. Yeah, when he dropped that bar in the earlier uh, part of the episode. Aegon the magnanimous. 
Ego no magnanimous. We're like, what the hell? What does that even mean? I mean, I know what it means, but still, it doesn't ring. It doesn't ring very well to the common folk. So he then asks for a better name, and uh, they call him Aegon the Dragon Cock. Yes, <laughs> yes. Aegon the Dragon Cock, the untamable beast. Funny little background uh, scene as Blood and Cheese sneak their way through the castle further and further into the uh, royal chambers here. We then get the most upsetting part of the episode for millions of people across the across the world as the dog gets kicked. <laughs> PETA is definitely going to be watching the production of this show as it moved forward. No, don't worry though. No dragons or dogs were harmed in the making of this show. I'm pretty sure that was a CGI dog. I'm hoping it was. Fingers crossed. Anyways, they're sort of getting lost a little bit. As uh, Cheese mentions, he doesn't quite know his way around, but he does know that the royals live on this floor. He mentions he's not supposed to be up here. Uh, this is not his normal area for rat catching. And they come across a handmaiden who notices some suspicious activity. And look at the eyebrows on her, man. I don't know. She's got something going on. Jokes aside, she kind of uh, she kind of doesn't buy into this whole rat catcher thing. She seems to be uh, more aware than she might let on. And he notices right away he, he fucked up. He needs to get out. He needs to get his job done and get out. He goes for the knife. He's now on a ticking clock as he knows he's been, uh, he's been made. He's been had. He then comes upon the room where Cheese has found the victim, but not the right one. He's found Helena. <laughs> Who the fuck is she? <laughs> She's the queen, she's. They're gonna have to take a son for a son. Turns out there's another son they can take instead. Now here's where we get our first little conflict in this scene as they don't know who is who. They're basically twins, kind of like Jamie Lannister, Cersei Lannister. When they were young, they looked identical. One is a girl, Jahera, and one is a boy, Jaharis. And they don't know which is which. They don't want to wake them up by checking. You know, it's kind of going to be a problem if both kids wake up and start screaming. They need to get this done efficiently and quietly. So they ask Elena to point out the right one. I look for a cock. The mother knows. Do anything but what I ask, and I'll bleed the whole lot of you. Helena actually tries to offer them a necklace instead, but they take the necklace and say, we still want the head. Tell us which one it is. Helena points out to the boy, but uh, Blood's not buying it. Wait, it's the other one. She's not going to give up the king's hair that easy. Cheese uh, seems to not kind of go along with this, as he suspects that Helena's actually being honest. No, she's telling true. He kind of sees through her character and sees that she's not going to be one to lie in a situation like this, you know? So he calls a reverse bluff on blood here. And he says, no, she's choosing the right one. This is the one we need. Good on you, Cheese. Damon's going to be pleased with Cheese. He's going to get a raise after this. And off screen, we hear them slicing the throat of the young heir to the throne, Jaehaerys. <laughs> Now, here's where the big controversy comes in. A, not only are they killing a child, yes, but B, book readers are very upset because in the book, this scene went down quite differently. When Blood and Cheese came upon Helena in the book, they had to have Helena make a different choice. She had to choose between a younger boy, Maelor, and an older boy, Jaehaerys. And they made her choose while both boys were awake. And she had to point at one of the sons and say, He's the one you should kill. And instead of killing the one that she wants, they end up killing the other one. And so one of the boys, I believe it's Melor, has to live with the fact that he watched his mother give him up for murder, basically. And so there's another complex layer of drama and intrigue in this scene that isn't quite captured here. But for first-time viewers and, and people who haven't read the books or know the story of Blood and Cheese to a T, I think this scene still works. A lot of people were also mad that they didn't show the actual beheading, but let's be real, guys. Do we want to watch a kid get his head chopped off? I just, I just don't think so. I think people more had an issue with the fact that they didn't follow the same dramatic sequence that the books did. Now, it kind of makes sense as we have never really seen Maelor before. He was kind of barely mentioned in the opening title sequence as one of the bloodlines from the uh, previous season. But outside of that, we don't really know that Maelor exists too much. It's not something that the viewers would be clued into. So it kind of makes sense that they just did the the twins here, Jahara and Jaharis. And um, yeah, Blood and Cheese end up getting Jaharis. They end up getting his head. But not before Helena is able to escape with her daughter, one of the other twins. And she runs to the Queen Mother Allison's room. And she finds this. Helena. Yep. 
Kristen and Allison back at it, banging in the bed. Now, here's where I have huge issues with this scene. One, Helena, how is she able to escape so easily from blood and cheese? One of them should have held her back, maybe even tied her up, gagged her, whatever it is, so that she couldn't warn any other guards as they're cutting off the head. You know, that makes sense to kind of keep her at bay, at least until they do the full job. Why did they let her go? Not sure. Also, uh, Kristen and Allison, you have this ultimate duty to keep this under wraps, no pun intended, to keep this sexual uh, endeavor secret. And yet you just leave the door unlocked, not even jammed, not locked at all. Nobody's guarding. Kristen Cole is off duty. He's supposed to be on duty, probably guarding Helena. So the fact that Allison is banging Kristen is probably one of the main reasons that this event was even allowed to go down in the first place. So a huge major F up from our characters here. And it just doesn't make sense how Allison was able to get away so easily and how she was able to get in the room so easily when Kristen and Allison are both a little smarter than this. They should at least have the door barred at minimum. That kind of bothered me. Anyway, she sits down and she tells Allison what happened as Kristen looks away in shame. They killed the boy. We get confirmation. She was telling the truth. Cheese knew. Cheese knew all. Cheese can see the truth. He's a, he's a valuable player. And boom, the episode ends there. And we get 60 minutes, guys. We actually get 60 minutes, double the length of the average Acolyte episode for $3 million less. And it's 3,000 times better. So I'm going to give you a little rating here before we go. And I want to ask you guys in the comments what you guys thought of this episode. Are you fans of how they changed Blood and Cheese? Are you not fa fans of how they changed it? Uh, do you even care because you didn't read the book? Uh, how did it hit you as a first-time viewer? How did it hit you as a book reader? Also, give me your ratings on the episode down below. I'm going to give this a 7.5, uh, maybe even an 8 out of 10. It, it, it does have uh, the issue of having to reset its pacing back to zero, being the start of a new season, even though we carried forward with a really high momentum from the final episode of the previous season. This kind of resets the pacing. It's a little more quaint. It's a little more slow. It's a little more of a chess pieces being put back on the board for us to uh, for us to speculate and get ready for the main events of the rest of this season. So it could have been a little more exciting. We could have used a little more in Winterfell, in my opinion. I think this episode should have been 15 minutes longer and we should have maybe 10 minutes longer, maybe even five minutes longer and just Get a little more of Jace. I think Jace was gypped in this episode. We kind of skipped over his whole entire journey. We didn't even get to see him navigating the political scene in terms of uh, the veil. You know, he secured them as an alliance, but we never got to see it. In the books, he goes to other places as well. They kind of just glossed right over all that. We didn't even really get to see Jace arrive on his dragon in Winterfell. And also, I think the blood and cheese part was a little bit ham-fisted. Not all the way, but just... It could have been done a lot better, in my opinion. But um, yeah, overall, nothing was wasted in this episode, I feel. Everything mattered. Every piece of dialogue uh, counted towards the story. And I think this episode might even be viewed better in the long term as the season plays out. So, guys, this has been Stark Cinema. If you like these episode reviews, I'll do more. Please hit the like button, subscribe, comment down below. And yeah, I love you 3000. Have a great day. <laughs>